Hey everyone, thanks for coming out today to our webinar. Um, I'm Rebecca Rowland, I'm the Community Engagement Editor here at Life in Time, and I am excited to introduce our guest today, Diane Rigoni, the Director of the Breadfruit Institute at the National Tropical Botanical Garden, Birgit Cameron, co-founder and head of Patagonia Provisions, and Jackie Oshira, Life in Time correspondent. I just wanted to say thank you to our members, especially for supporting our work and making this possible for us. Um, as a reader-funded publication, we couldn't do this without you. If you want to join Life and Time as a member, you can join us at lifeandtime.com slash membership. I'm going to turn it over to Jackie now, and she'll take it away. Okay. Hi, thanks, Rebecca. Um, let's just get this conversation started with question of the hour. What is a breadfruit, and why is it so special? Well, good morning. It's wonderful to be here. Breadfruit is a starchy staple crop that grows on the long lived tropical trees. So think of it as a potato or rice or any of the starchy crops that are sustained humanity, but that are field crops. And it's one that grows on a tree. Um, yeah. So where do we mostly find that grown? It's a, it's a tree of the tropics, so it grows between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn in the equatorial belt, grows in Hawaii and throughout the Pacific Islands and the Caribbean, grows in the main U.S. mainland, but only in the very tip of Florida, down in the Key West and down the Keys and up to Miami. It's a pretty wide stretch. Um, let's see. So, Diane, you are kind of the breadfruit expert here. Um, tell us a bit about your your journey into breadfruit, what you're doing with the Breadfruit Institute and the National Tropical Botanical Gardens. All right. Well, my journey started in the 80s when I first learned about breadfruit living in Hawaii and learning about the need to conserve breadfruit diversity and traditional crop fruit diversity in the Pacific Islands. So I set out on a quest to study breadfruit in the islands where it was extensively grown, starting in Samoa and documenting traditional variety of which there are hundreds throughout the Pacific and the associated knowledge, which was very deep and rich and goes back centuries, if not millennia. And the varieties and that knowledge were at, at very fragile and at risk because of cultural and environmental changes. So I put a, set, to get, set, set up the world's largest conservation collection of breadfruit varieties and been doing research with many teams of people from organ, research institutions um, in the US and Canada to study this collection, to really identify good, really good nutritious varieties and learn more about it. So building on that extensive research on nutrition, on when the trees produce, fruit quality, we then started a program to propagate trees and distribute them, looking at knowing the value breadfruit had in so many places and its potential to feed people in, in Hawaii and other places as well as provide um, local food security and also p potentially economic development, but always based on this traditional varieties and knowledge and the importance of conserving this. And Breadfruit's one example, this is happening with almost every crop plant in the world, that the diversity, biodiversity, agrobiodiversity is disappearing and the knowledge about it. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, so that is with the National Tropical Botanical Garden on Maui, correct? Like that's where the main breadfruit collection is? Yeah, so um, go ahead. A lot of your work is on Kauai now, and what um, are you doing there? Well, the National Tropical Botanical Garden, NTBG, is, is a private nonprofit organization. Breadfruit is our logo. It has been since the 70s. The main collection is on is on Maui, but I've always been based on Kauai. Uh, our breadfruit, our headquarters is on Kauai, our libraries, our research buildings. So Maui, Hana was a field site for me. So based on Kauai, I managed the institute, our research programs, out, outreach. So everything we do is, is based from the headquarters on Kauai, but with the collection. And we have a small collection on Kauai in the McBride Garden, and I think one of our topics is going to be with Birgit is agroforestry, and that's the big projects that we have going with this. So a duplicate, a small collection of 25 trees. So we had this, 
varieties in two locations, but then we transformed that into a breadfruit agroforest. Cool. All right. So um, let's go to Birgit. Tell us a bit about Patagonia Provisions and how you got into breadfruit. Sure. And thanks for having me here today. This is really great. Always lovely to see Diane too. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, let's see. I guess I could start by just saying that, you know, the, the task that was given to me, um, because many people say, well, what does a food company, why is a food company, I mean, a, an apparel company in, in food? <laughs> and, you know, because we touch, we've touched agriculture for many, many years through cotton, ulex, wool, hemp, all these different agricultural products, people don't really think about, you know, clothing being agriculturally derived, but it is in many ways, <laughs> and 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 uh, so you know we we recognized that um, you know agriculture as it relates to the climate problems that we're having today, um, it it is one of the biggest contributors to to these issues, and so we couldn't stay away. And the task that was given to me was, what would a food company look like for Patagonia? And so everything we make has a very, very deep reason for being. Our model is identifying problems and uh, coming up, you know, consulting the science, so consulting people like Diane, um, uh, and um, determining if we can showcase a better path forward in food and beverage by uh, working with the solutions that we find in science and creating a product that can then therefore, you know, exemplify a, a new path forward. And breadfruit and Diane's work, you know, being so focused on regenerative organic um, agroforestry or agroforestry in general, where you have this unbelievable diversity, um, multi-cropping system that can provide uh, economic stimulation for the areas where it grows, uh, food security for the areas that it grows. Um, it made so much sense to us to make sure that breadfruit could stay alive in, uh, you know, in the communities uh, where it exists and create market pull for it by, uh, by creating a product. And um, so we, you know, uh, in being introduced to Diane uh, and the, the NTBG and the folks at the Breadfruit Institute was, it was just an absolute no brainer to proceed with this idea that, you know, we could showcase this and, and make sure that we put something out in the market that, that could help people understand what breadfruit is all about and, and how important it is uh, from a, a people and planet point of view, uh, to keep these kinds of crops alive. Now, so that's a, a long way of telling you <laughs> how we got to this, but. Okay, cool. So um, I'm sure Life and Times readers and viewers are pretty in the know about all of these terms, but at a high level, um, can somebody explain what agroforestry is and what makes it different from um, conventional agriculture? Okay. Well, Agroforestry as a term has was coined in the 70s or 80s, but agroforestry as a practice has existed. Humans have practiced it for millennia and it's planting. So we tend to think of agriculture as a monocultural system. And in a lot of places it is one crop, but agroforestry is multi-story, multi-layered planting. So um, I am Italian, so I'm going to use my hands here. So you have an upper canopy of trees, high canopy of trees. So you have some provide shade. You have mid mid level plants all the way. So it's multi layered and it changes over time and it changes over 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 this over space. So you have short term crops that are maybe harvested in a few months or less. You have mid mid middle term crops. And then you have long-term crops. So in the case of a breadfruit agroforest, breadfruit would be your, your long-term crop and you're changing things. So you have things in there that always are there or are there for years, depending on how long you have that land and you manage that land. 
And the beauty of it is also they're, they're closed systems. So ideally there's no external inputs of fertilizer or, or materials like that. It's all generated by the plants that you select in that system. So you're providing materials back. A lot of people um, have, have said to me, oh, don't call it an agroforest. That's too complicated. Just call it a food forest. But a food forest is usually a monocrop in a monoculture in the sense that you have a lot of different kind of fruit trees growing, but they're all trees and they're all growing at the same level. Got it. So what differentiates agroforestry from a food forest then is that you have a lot of different layers as well and different kinds of plants on top yeah. of like these fruiting trees. Yes. Cool. Yes. Um, is there a reason that uh, we're putting this emphasis on breadfruit being grown in an agroforestry model? That's a wonderful question. And when I was doing my field work in the Pacific to collect, I went ended up going to 50 different islands. I was focused on the trees, the breadfruit trees and the varieties and, you know, people's yards, people's what they call plantations and their growing areas. And I saw this one scene, I mean, one landscape, and it was all breadfruit and other trees. And I was always so intrigued by that. And so I started really looking into that. And it's kind of a long way around to answering that this is a way Pacific Islanders have grown breadfruit for millennia. They might have one tree around their, their house for convenience, but those trees were all planted in a sustainable long-term system. And one of the best documented ones is in an island in Micronesia and over 120 useful species was documented as growing in that one, in this agroforestry system. So looking at how breadfruit is grown and, and how, what's a good way, because it, it helps the land, it helps the trees and all the plants in it, and it helps the people. It's also very good for on hillsides. So you have watershed protection and erosion protection. We didn't want to see breadfruit become a plantation, another big plantation crop. And it could because we've developed with a team of researchers in Canada a, a, a way to micropropagate breadfruit trees by the hundred thousands, even millions. So we thought this is an opportunity to look at how, how with someone like Patagonia, how and provisions, how we could help inform a way of looking at how to grow breadfruit in in a more sustainable, regenerative system, and especially one that is for smallholder farmers built on what they know, and this is not just in the Pacific Islands, but throughout the tropics. And the average farmer in the tropics has two acres of land. So what could you do on two acres of land to start an acre or even your backyard with one breadfruit tree and then have it scalable larger and larger and larger to a landscape scale? Well, that sounds like a lot of work. Um, uh, Birgit, how does Patagonia Provision support uh, Diane's work with the Brentford Institute. Well, because of what Diane was saying, we we felt it was really important um, first and foremost to to help fund a demonstration area at NTPG that could really showcase how this could be done in a way that on two acres you could have this incredible diversity um, providing tons of fruit and veg and just a variety of of uh, crops and Diane can elaborate on that um, but we we felt that that was really important to say if we're going to do this and showcase this and talk about it we need to create a replicable uh, environment where we can help uh, you know document what was you know how this how this is benefiting um, the soil and species within it, um, but also to provide a forum to ed help educate the community and farmers who are interested in taking this on beyond, you know, to either get away from a monocrop situation, which, you know, certainly in Hawaii, we know the history of that with the plantations and, and a lot of, uh, you know, chemical use and pesticides and things like that. It's just not the right way um, 
to go into the future. And so this agroforest demonstration area can really be a vehicle to help uh, provide that education, provide a new, you know, information about a new path forward and how these people can adopt this on that land in that location. And um, I think, Diane, it'd be great if you elaborated on what came out of that in the last year or so. It, you know, it's really an incredible thing to to then see the ripple effect of, of what this, this kind of uh, educational area can provide. Okay, um, and thank you, Birgit and Patagonia, for all the incredible support that you have, you have given the garden as a nonprofit organization. It's so important. So thank you. We had a two-acre site in the garden. It was old plantation land, sugarcane that was and just mown, and it's kind of like an open field. And we had twenty-five breadfruit trees and breadnut trees planted in two rows that had been planted in 2004 and 2006. So we had an established orchard. So agroforestry was as a as a practice was new to us. So it we it was we had we learn we had to learn how to do this. So we work with um, an agroforestry expert who has a program called agroforestry.net and he helped and uh, an expert in regenerative organic agriculture who was on the institute staff. And so they advised us, they put together the plan for this, because you really have to think not just what you're putting in now, but you have to be able to visual, envision the future of what these plants are going to do and look like and what you're planning. And you have to phase planning so long. So we started in August 2017 and over, you know, so it's evolving and developing and maturing. and. I'd say at any one time we have about a hundred different species growing in the agroforest. But in 2020, because of COVID, the pandemic, and the um, impact on the island of Kauai with um, so much hunger, increased hunger, and food security need for food, we really focused on the production. And so we've always, as part of the agroforest, is monitored production and yield. So we weekly, as as produce anything, whether it's a cut flower is harvested, we monitor that. And if breadfruit is harvested, we count each breadfruit. We monitor how long it takes to harvest the breadfruit and then we weigh it. So we have, have a production yield. And 2020 was, um, I have to put my glasses on to read this, we harvested, and I say we because I didn't harvest much from it, but my extraordinary staff, Noelle Dickinson and her assistant, Graham Talliver, harvested 7,000 pounds of breadfruit. And each of the, and each breadfruit weighs from one to four pounds. So figure out how many breadfruit that was. And I do have a count, but we go, we do the pounds. And then they harvested 2,800 pounds of other crops from the agroforest. So nearly five times, 10,000 pounds. And all of that food was donated and provided to our local community through food banks and organizations that distribute. And this year, just so far, um, they've harvested 3,500 pounds of breadfruit and about um, 900 pounds of other crops. So it's it's really exciting to see how productive it, it is. As to, as to trees, we planted some, a few more breadfruit trees, so as the trees are maturing, but as we also focused on really high yield productive crops to plant in there as well, because we wanted, wanted to maximize production. And with all of that, none of that is we, we, we don't bring any external materials in. So in addition to the use, the plants that are, a lot of the plants that are grown in the agroforest are not food and they're not flowers, cut flowers or ornamentals. They are biomass producers because we are planting plants. So the bananas are, the, are a workhorse because not only do they provide a really, a lot of nutritious food, they, those, trunks are cut down and they the, the microorganisms break them down and so they feed the soil. So we have a lot of plants in the in production that we don't quantify 
but that's adding back to build the soil and to be part of that system, integrated system. Five tons of food from two acres. Yes, that two people harvested. <laughs> so that's pretty it, amazing. it is a lot of work, but it's a lot of food. So you can um, see so clearly how that can really in, in, in communities that need, you know, this kind of uh, either economic stimulation because they have diversity in what they can sell. Um, they can feed their community. They can, you know, have food for themselves, you know, and certainly as we deal with climate change issues, you know, and, and uh, on the islands of, you know, Hawaii, the collective, you know, I think it's an enormous amount of food that is um, imported in. And, you know, if there were, I think the statistic is if there was an issue that happened with climate or, you know, the food supply chain stopped for whatever reason, there's only, uh, some people say three days, Diane, some people say two weeks, but either way, it's it's a problem um, of, you know, the amount of time that 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 they would have or you know food that was imported and so i think the self-sustaining aspect of this is really really important for areas um you know like hawaii or other other places where bedford grows to be able to have that kind of um uh, you know security that reliance on things that you can grow there that that, that could feed the communities so yeah i think the statistic is we import somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of the food that we eat here. Right. Um, and if, say, something were to happen to the port of Honolulu, which is, I think, the only port large enough to handle all of these like really big container ships that come in from the mainland, we'd have five to seven days of food on the shelf. So it's not a great situation, but it's also not something that we think about very much because uh, the boats haven't stopped yet. And I guess we're not expecting them to stop, but it's, it's a problem um, in case something does happen. Um, so, Breadfruit could be uh, a really big helper on that front um, to Hawaiian or ho the, sorry, food like sustainability here in Hawaii. Um, what are the challenges to that aside from growing more breadfruit? You want me to tackle that? We're good to <laughs> you, you, you were closest to that one, Diane. So I leave that one to you as you're living and breathing that. <laughs> I think it's that's a, it's multi it's boy that's that's a there are a lot of facets to that question so part of it is just for breadfruit is adoption and acceptance and knowledge about it so the institute has been involved for more than a decade with um, through the Ha'ulu Ka'ulu project um, with the Hawaii Homegrown Food Network on the Big Island in a campaign to really promote and raise awareness about breadfruit, about eating more breadfruit, how do you use it, how do you prepare it, all, all of those aspects. So there's still, there's that educational component. And then there is the availability of trees and planting material, which we had, we had worked on. And through a project we called Plant a Tree of Life, we distributed over 10,000 breadfruit trees throughout the state of Hawaii. And, um, 2014 to 2012 to 2015 into 2016. So now those trees are out there. But on the bigger picture, it's really what kind of decisions and are going to be made at the state level and in the state with agriculture and food with water and land. Those are the two big issues. So except those accessibility, how do farmers get access to land and water, small farmers and large farmers. So there's that, there's that issue that's beyond the scope. I think of this, this discussion, um, you could have probably a year's worth of webinars about that, but I think it's, you know, it's starting in that people are planting and there are more breadfruit trees now growing in Hawaii than have ever been grown here. And there's a co-op on the Big Island that started with one farmer. I think you visited them, Jackie, and that 50 or 100 farmer. So we're the wedge. We're the small wedge, this project and what we're doing to kind of crack open the iceberg. Well, I don't want to crack open an iceberg, but <laughs> knock down the walls, the barricade. Yeah, it's, it's pretty amazing. Like growing up here in Hawaii, um, I hardly 
ate breadfruit when I was a kid. Uh, my mom would sometimes bring home a breadfruit from maybe like a coworker and she would like make ulu chips. Uh, but I think in the last five or so years, breadfruit's kind of been everywhere. Like you're seeing breadfruit on restaurant menus, you're seeing like prepared uh, breadfruit hummus in the store. Um, I think maybe five years ago, it would have been hard to find even a fresh whole breadfruit in a grocery store. But um, now, yeah, I've eaten breadfruit several times over the last year. Uh, so I think things seem to be moving in the right direction. Um, Birgit, how are, I guess, how is Patagonia Provisions, um, yeah, contributing to this cause? I know that like um, part of your, uh, the life cycle of supporting a, um, an agricultural product um, tries to take it through like that level of providing for the local people and then providing a further market um, for the product once it outgrows the local market. Um, can you tell me a bit about what, how the, that, where breadfruit is on that cycle and um, what the plans are for the future? Sure. It, we do see this as a really long-term project. And um, to also showcase it in other locations as well. Um, so although we started in Hawaii uh, and built the, the helped to fund the, the guard, the uh, demonstration area there, um, we also worked with Diane to look at other locations uh, that breadfruit was prevalent and that we could uh, showcase, you know, uh, this sort of from tree to product um, supply chain. We also worked with um, the uh, some folks in Costa Rica, um, Earth University, and then Jungle Foods uh, to, you know, just in our exploration, determining who was doing what, where, uh, trees that feed in, um, in Jamaica. And, you know, there's many, you know, because of Diane's work, you know, many areas now where, uh, you know, breadfruit is, is seen as something of value or at least that the, the seed has been planted around that. And uh, so we, we looked in all of these locations to find out, you know, where we could thread a uh, from tree to product supply chain, um, you know, to make, to, to showcase the first product. And when we found that the, the best place to do that initially um, was, was for us in Costa Rica, uh, and uh, so we, we began there. Um, and, you know, although there are other, you know, really great projects helping in, in, you know, or really, you know, coming up with wonderful solutions in other locations in Hawaii, um, you know, the Costa Rica presented itself as um, the first, the, the place that, that we could see a lot of the infrastructure already there that could help us go from, harvest to uh, cleaning to uh, drying to milling and um, we also needed because uh, breadfruit is also very um, fragile in that it ripens very quickly uh, in order to make it a, a, you know a, have a longer shelf life for it we needed to turn it into something like flour and so that's what we did we we, we we thread together all the components that would allow us to uh, work with the local communities there, uh, prevent breadfruit trees from being cut down, agroforests from being cut down. Because I think that's, you know, people are still sort of in that mindset of, of you know, clear cut and put in monoculture. Um, and, and I think this effort was to also help prevent that. So we found um, local communities that were really invested in, in, in working 
um, in this in this area, and um, started to some of them are starting to convert their land from um, issues they've had around monoculture to the benefits of agroforestry, and um, so we were able to solve for that. We were able to find a place that could dry. Uh, you know, cut, wash, dry the the breadfruit, um, and then another place to mill the breadfruit um, into flour, so that we could have it in a stable form to then take that and put it into a product. And so uh, that was you know our first product and the first real widely distributed commercial product of of uh, uh, you know that incorporates breadfruit in a big way. Um, our, our little uh, breadfruit crackers. Um, and the story is on the back. You can find them at, at patagoniaprovisions.com or at the NTPG uh, garden store. <laughs> um, but anyway, this this really tells the story and you know kind of showcases that breadfruit can be incredibly versatile. Um, crackers are only the tip of the arrow of what we can make from this. So and, you know anything that you could make with flour. Uh, or a lot of things could be, um, you know, turned into product. And the other aspect of this is that it's gluten-free. So there's many reasons to start to incorporate it in different products. And then I think, you know, obviously there's ma many other usages. Um, in Hawaii, you have pono pies. Um, you've got people, as you said, uh, you know, incorporating it into restaurants and food service now. Um, it makes an amazing um, French fry, uh, all those kinds of things. So, uh, but that's our journey. You know, we ended up in Costa Rica, but we are uh, absolutely expanding this pro uh, this project this project into other areas, uh, depending on what is emerging in terms of infrastructure for us to be able to, you know, put it into product. Mm -hmm. And, and so may I kind of, of, oh, yeah, go for it. Well, yeah. People have expressed concern to me. Um, you know, I, I have a social media for the Institute and we'll put products and other information up. And sometimes people will comment about, oh, you know, now that it's a cracker, we're not going to be able to afford to buy breadfruit. I saw this from the from someone in the Caribbean. And I think that's a valid concern. We've seen that with a lot of um crop development and product development. And so looking at planting so many, at least here in Hawaii, getting so many trees planted and that there's an abundance of breadfruit. And so people have it in their backyards and it's not just um, plantation scale or agricultural scale, but that it is wherever breadfruit can grow, it's also a, a, a food crop that people have it in their yards for their families, for their friends, for their community. So part of that, I think that's a key part, piece of this is having those trees available for as many people who want to grow them. But it, it, is, right. yeah. it is an important thing for us. And we've, we've addressed that by providing trees, as many trees as we could to people with that goal, have them in your communities as well. And I would like to see that there's just an abundance of breadfruit in, for all purposes here in Hawaii. And we're just starting. I mean, if you think that Hawaii imports I think it's 50,000 either. I think it's 50,000 pounds or tons. That's the big difference of potato and potato products into the state. If we could just grow enough breadfruit to import, substitute some of that, the benefits, the local benefits to the people and our economy would be huge. So looking at, looking at it that way as well. And it preserves something that should be grown in those locations. And, you know, because like I was saying earlier, I think in many areas, the breadfruit or the agroforests are in danger of being clear cut or, you know, so if there isn't value, um, then it won't exist. And so that's the idea is not, not to create market pool in a way where it makes it inaccessible, but rather have a really nice balance between that community accessibility and creating value so that it remains in the ground or people want to grow more of it because there is, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, it's becoming more prevalent um, in, in, in people's minds or they know how to use it or, or create food with it because 
it once was, if you go back to the history, it once was a, sta a staple um, for many of these communities and that, start, that started to wane. And so I think there was a danger that it was not going to be valued enough to keep it in the ground. But you know, I think that's also an important element of this is that businesses like ours and others need to take responsibility for what that means. So if there is a, a concern about price or food security or you know being having something like this be taken and 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 altered in a way that it it wouldn't be accessible anymore, I mean, it is up to us to make sure that all elements of what it means to commercialize something, are, are taken care of. And most importantly, the community comes first, the farmers come first, the people who are, uh, you know, really responsible for, um, you know, making this available in the first place. That That's a business decision. You have to value other things beyond the, the almighty dollar um, as, as part of your business model. Uh, that's, that's really essential and it's at the core of what we do. Diane, I really like what you're saying about um, making sure there were just a ton of breadfruit trees in the community um, as a way to prevent uh, prices and stuff from being unreachable for locals. Um, I remember growing up, I don't think we'd ever bought an avocado in Hawaii. Everybody that you know has a tree. You There are like several weeks during the summer when you have too many avocados uh, that you know to know what to do with. Um, so I think that's a great example of like yeah, this thing that can you can buy um, that does uh, make money, but that just having so much of it in the community just makes it really accessible to anybody. Um, let's see. So we were talking a little, uh, Birgit, you're talking a little bit about how you want to keep these um, crops that are grown in these places. Um, and breadfruit was traditionally grown. Um, by the native Hawaiians before Western contact. But like unlike taro, which has kind of remained within the popular consciousness here in Hawaii, breadfruit kind of slipped away. Um, I know this is a little bit of a complex question, but Diane, do you have any idea how that happened? It was that it was a combination of factors. I mean, you think of the just devastating population loss after first contact because of disease. How, you know, nine out of 10 Hawaiians died. And so when you have a, you know, that level of loss and of people and then the cultural knowledge, it's just, you know, Tara was a big cultural piece and, uh, and, and remained so. Um, and I think was readopted in a lot of ways with in the 70s with the Hawaiian Renaissance um, and cultural reawakening. And breadfruit was important, but just I think with the profound changes in, in the culture and in agriculture, its use declined and its use in, in, in the popular, popular knowledge of it. But there are always areas that breadfruit remained strong um, where there are a lot of breadfruit trees, like where Hana, East Maui, breadfruit, there's a lot of breadfruit trees. So I think there were pockets where breadfruit remained an important staple crop and was important. And if you look at it um, in, in, the, in the legends and the songs and the, the um, iconography around breadfruit, it was, very, it was very rich. So that's a really complex question. And I think, um, you know, parts of Hawaii were a real were a, was a really strong breadfruit culture, and so people. There's been a lot of work being done recently to kind of show show this. I think I don't know if that answers it, but it's it's a very complex question. All right, <laughs> thanks for but, giving but it I a stab. But I think it's you know, still beloved and used by a lot of people in a lot of places, and now more widely so. Right. Okay. I think we need to switch, <clears throat> sorry, to audience questions, if that's all right with you guys. Sure. Cool. So here's the first question. What other breadfruit varieties besides Ma'afala and Otea have shown high potential for use and how can other varieties be accessed? I think this is for you, Diane. Okay. Well, 
we when we did the research on the collection over about a decade, we identified 10 to 12 varieties that we felt were had high potential for use. And that was based on their uh, nutritional qu uh, qualities, we, high, you know, high protein, follows very, has the highest protein content in the flower. And it, we looked at 94 varieties, intensive and nutritional studies. So Ma'afala was picked for that reason. It's compact and, and also has a good flavor, a really nice flavor. Otea, those two are have become available and used because we were successful with the micropropagation, which is also a decade or more long, long project. So if we have a variety, there are these other eight to 10 varieties that we want to get into culture. And we've been working, some of them we've been working on with partners for a decade and have not been successful yet, but we're, we keep trying. But just from the time you put a variety into the tissue culture project process and that you can get small plants out, it's a year and a half to two at minimum. So we are working and we are still working with partners to get those other varieties available so that they can be accessed and we don't provide planting material directly from the collection because you know we only have in some cases one tree of one of these varieties and they don't produce enough planting material um, and they're also you know they're getting old they're 30 or 40 years old now so it's it's a it's something that we've been working on. I know people get impatient, especially here in Hawaii, especially people who are um, want a lot of different varieties. They want one of as many varieties as they can have. So it's it's difficult to do, but we are working on it. And my my goal has been by now we would have had five to ten varieties, and that's still my goal, and we're still working on it. And as it, as they become available through our partners we will be able, more trees will be available for distribution. And the goal for why other, the high potential, which is one of the questions, the main question is, we also looked at varieties, breadfruit is, is um, can be seasonal production. So no, one or two varieties produce fruit almost year round, a little bit of fruit, but you have big peaks. So in it, where it, in production and that production will shift depending on where you are geographically but we wanted to we pick varieties that would have an overlap so ideally by planting four or five of these varieties you would have an extended season as well so those varieties are in that mix as well well i think we have one more question for you diane uh, with agroforestry intercropped cultivation of breadfruit trees, do you have any research evidence of the mutual benefit of mycorrhizal networks of fungi among the trees? We, <laughs> that research has just been, been started. There was one study, a graduate student at um, Northwestern University in Chicago Botanical Garden, it's doing a research project looking on that. But the exciting thing about the agroforestry project and its accessibility on the South Shore is, is the potential to do research projects and these kind, answer those kind of questions. So preliminary work has been done on what the mycorrhizal networks are within there, but it's a, a rich field for more research in that two acre site. Cool. All right, next question. Have there been efforts to replicate the success of best practices to develop a thriving breadfruit ecosystem across different countries? Very good. I know you talked a little bit about this earlier when you were talking about how Patagonia Provisions um, really got into breadfruit and started looking in the Caribbean. Um, is there continued work going on? Um, Absolutely. Um, in in Costa Rica, that a lot of that work is led by Jungle Foods. Uh, I think I mentioned Earth University um, as well. They they are absolutely working on uh, agroforest systems and how breadfruit can be a part of that as well. Uh, and uh, so we we do see you know some some really great ripple effect from you know, the actions that have been um, invested in so far. 
And then I think other locations too. I think Diane could probably speak to the efforts with Trees That Feed and 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 other locations um, where example is starting to really uh, flourish and, and education around how these you know these trees and agroforest system can be beneficial. Um, so it's it's emerging in in wonderful ways. Um, in, in, you know, many locations. Well, what we have done at the Institute is, you know, the information resources. So working with uh, Craig Elovich, a breadfruit production guide with basic practices about breadfruit production from tree to table and made those available for online as free PDFs. Then as part of the agroforestry demonstra demonstration, a book on agroforestry, uh, an, ag an agroforestry guide. And then the Institute is a, is a very lean and often very mean organization because they're Institute program because there are only three of us on staff. So uh, we have big dreams and visions for what we'd like to see, but we are limited by capacity. So as Beer gets said, a lot of this is through partnerships, is working like trees that feed organization that's on the ground in countries. So yes, this is a vision and for us and it'll be through building capacity of staff and developing more, more resources that would be widely available. And they're just, there's such an emerging network of people who are addressing this. So we're not having to do it alone. There's a group that just founded a big network based out of the Pacific called the Bread, Breadfruit People. And it's with a, um, a wide network of the uh, a Pacific Farmers Organization that throughout the region. So these kind of resources and materials and networks and replicating these practices, um, I think we'll see more and more of that. And um, just one other thing is, you know, think about the University of Hawaii, where I did my master's and PhD in horticulture. It should be, I think, the premier tropical agriculture university in, on the planet. Just a few years ago, filled a faculty position for someone who is dedicated to traditional crops and is taking a big research focus on breadfruit and Dr. Lincoln. So that's really exciting because now he's doing a lot of research and his graduate students on questions that are that are going to answer or help address some of these questions about agronomy. Uh, where can breadfruit be grown? Like what kind of what countries or what band of latitude? Uh, well, between the tropics of Cancer and Capricorn, so they're 21 degrees north and south. So that big band of the planet and as I said into South Florida. And with climate change and global warming, <laughs> you know, Texas might be the next state where redfruit can be grown. But right now it, it is is only in Florida. Got it. Okay. A couple more questions. Um, is it possible to visit the agroforest at the NTBG? It is the agroforest was, was um, specifically put in the McBride Garden on Kauai where it's more accessible. So um, visitors to the garden who go on self-guided tours of the garden have the opportunity to visit the agroforest and as a visitor um, through the tour program. And then we, or we also have events that will, not events, but educational programs, workshops that we'll start having um, again, probably next year. We'll start planning those. Cool, so the garden's open now, even with all the restrictions I guess they're no, the starting garden, to lift. Huh? Absolutely, the garden has reopened, cool. but we have we adhere to all recommended, you know, math, social distancing, all of that. But yes, the garden is open. If you go to the garden's website, ntbg.org/tours, you can find information about visiting any of our gardens. All right. One more question about Kauai. I rarely see breadfruit at the Kauai farmers markets or on the menu at any restaurants. Are there any places on the island where we can find breadfruit? <laughs> Kauai is behind the curve, sadly, in, in uh, planting of trees. There are pockets of trees in, in some areas, and pe more people are planting trees. Several farmers, sadly, that I know had planted lots of trees, lost all of their trees to wild pigs. And so 
the, you do see it at the farmers market, and um, especially in season, and rather, and on the restaurants, it's on various restaurants. Um, I, off the top of my head, can't say now, especially with COVID. I don't know, but we'll see. You know, hopefully, see more of it. There is a local bakery in Kilauea that does feature breadfruit products. Cool. So I think we're gonna start our wrap up conversations here. Um, Diane, can you tell me a little bit about the near future for the Breadfruit Institute? Um, what your next steps are, what kind of programs you're gonna be running in the coming year or two? The near future is filling a critical position, which is a PhD position. So hoping to bring that person on board um, before the end of the year, and then looking at um, wh wh where are we with our global projects and our partners, kind of reassessing like everyone has after this past year. So um, the one thing I do want to have done um, is we had a searchable database to the varieties in the collection, 150 varieties on our website. So I think that's first and foremost in 2022 to have that that website back up there. So and continue with the agroforest and the project and the pro, you know, the growth of the agroforest as well. So and given your extensive knowledge of breadfruit and your long history working with it, um, how do you feel about its capacity to I guess, improve Hawaii's food security and the trajectory that it's on? I think we have a long road ahead of us, but I'm very optimistic about it because if you look at where we were a 10 years ago or 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, we've seen a profound sea change. So I, I am optimistic that we will see more people are gonna grow breadfruit. There's gonna be more, more development of products that are available locally. And then ideally there will be more um, value added products. So people will see the benefit and value of growing breadfruit for local consumption. So I, I think there's a bright future, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work and a lot of dedicated people. And it's gonna take resources to support farmers and this, you know, this economy, nascent economy around breadfruit. And also the cultural piece, really appreciating and not taking advantage of the cultural piece, the Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, but involving and embracing their knowledge and, and capacity in this as well. Yeah, I think this past year has really woken some people up to the um, urgent need of feeding Hawaii a little bit better. Um, I know that was a really big worry early on that the ships would stop coming. Um, so hopefully that's given people a little bit of a kick in the butt to start thinking about where their food is coming from um, and choose local options more often. Mm -hmm. uh, Birgit, how about Patagonia Provisions? What does the near future look like for you guys? Well, certainly for breadfruit and agroforestry, you know, absolutely a continued awareness building uh, program and campaigning around, around how important this is from a, um, a both aspects, people and planet. So people, you know, supporting thriving communities and planetary um, really, you know, agroforests are so important for drawing down carbon and 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 helping um, us uh, mitigate the issues we're facing with climate. And uh, so that's a, a keen focus for us. Uh, I also think clearly continued support of the uh, NTPG and Breadfruit Institute, uh, Agroforest, and, and the, the education for farmers to be able to learn about what they can produce on, on two acres of land uh, and um, have an abundance of food and, um, you know, sort of take back the land in Hawaii that has been ravaged by what I was saying earlier about the pesticides or, or monocropping or uh, these plantation models that, that were devastating to, to the land. Um, I think this is an opportunity to, to put back on the land what is what should be there. What does the land tell us it should have on it? 
So our support of that is, is really um, paramount. And then the other is to just make sure that, you know, as more breadfruit becomes available and the infrastructure, now that is, this awareness is building, is growing, you know, what are the other communities we can support? Where can we um, provide um, market pull in a, in a non-extractive way um, that, that can help, um, you know, it, it really uh, expand um, these programs and this effort. I think that's really important and being non-extractive, uh, you know, by saying that, I mean that, you know, you have to feed the, the communities first and um, make that uh, a big focus. And then, you know, whatever is extra can, can be taken and put into something that can go wider but that's, that's an important element. So those would be three of many <laughs> focuses for the near future. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, I think Rebecca's about to hop back out on and we're gonna wrap up the webinar. Hey, back. Um, I just wanna thank everyone for taking the time to come out and check out this webinar. We really appreciate your time. Um, I just want to thank all our panelists for taking the time to speak to everyone today. Thank you so much. Um, this was incredible. Um, learning about breadfruit has been such a joy for all of us at Life and Time. It's something that we are not, we don't hear about enough on the mainland, and we're so excited to continue learning about it and to continue continue seeing the work that Patagon Provisions, as well as the Breadfruit Institute, is doing with it. Um, just want to thank Life and Time members again for supporting us at Life and Time. If you're not a member yet, we have a little thing on the screen right below. You can join. You can also follow us on Twitter if you're not yet. Um, you know, we post regular Life and Time things, articles, updates, more about webinars. You can also join our mailing list to find out about the next webinar coming up. And uh, thank you again. This video will be available to rewatch in the coming days. If you are CP'd, you'll get an email to you immediately. If not, you'll find it on our Twitter right there. Um, thank you again. Have a good day. <laughs>